you know, uh, this part is not here. And the fact that this is trivialized means that this guy is trivialized, but this is the tangent space to Fw minus one of y. Right, so we have uh, trivialization of the top exterior power of the tangent bundle, and this exactly gives us an orientation. Now, if we have any two w0 and w1, uh, again, you consider m gamma, right? This is a set of xt such that f of x gamma t is y. Again, you show that this is uh, the compact oriented manifold with boundary as before, and this is actually a, an oriented bordism between MW1 and MW2. And that's the end of the proof. Now, uh, here is one particular corollary of that. So if, uh, assume d is zero, right, then fw inverse of y is actually a finite uh, number of points, so say x1, xk, and this is oriented Right, so uh, in this particular case, this means that each point comes equipped with a sign, say epsilon one, and so on, epsilon k, right, where each epsilon j is just plus minus one. And so I can take the sum of all those uh, signs The statement is this uh, does not depend on uh, W. And this is, uh, you could call the degree of FW. Right, and even uh, more generally, so if you have d is bigger than zero, uh, then um, assume we also have a cohomology class of degree d in x, say with integral coefficients, but this is not really that important. Now we could integrate uh, this eta over mw, uh, so what I mean is uh, we take the pairing of the fundamental class of w with eta. So if you think of eta as a drum cohomology class, this is just the integral over mw of eta, and this is also independent of W. And this sounds now pretty much uh, similar to what I started with in the first lecture. Uh, this will be uh, exactly the form in which uh, our invariants uh, coming from gauge theory uh, will arise. Okay, are there any questions to that? If this is not the case, let me describe one more generalization.
and this is an equivariant setup. So what I mean is this. Assume we have, uh, again, a manifold uh, as we had before, uh, but it will be convenient to assume that X is, in fact, a Hilbert manifold. Uh, this is not actually important, but uh, we'll simplify uh, at least one step. And we have a Hilbert Lie group, G, And this acts on our manifold X. Uh, so I assume that the action is on the right. But again, this is, of course, not really important. Uh, but uh, what is a little bit more important is that uh, I, I will assume, so assume G acts freely on X. Now, uh, again, this assumption is not really uh, essential. You could do without that, uh, but uh, the arguments would be a little bit more messy. Uh, but uh, what we have is we have an infinitesimal action of uh, G on X that is a linear map from the Lie algebra of G into GX X. So this is the infinitesimal action. I will say that Hilbert submanifold S in X is a slice for the G action if, uh, so what we have, we have a natural, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, if X is a point in S and natural map, uh, so let me denote G times S to be the set of points, uh, you know, uh, S times G. So I, uh, I require this to be an open subset. So this is a subset in X. This is required to be open. And the natural map uh, from G cross S into G S is a diffeomorphism. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, G S, and this is a subset of X. So it doesn't need to be a diffeomorphism on the whole X, but on uh, a smaller subset. Uh, so here is an example uh, to make it perhaps a little bit uh, more visual. So uh, assume we have a two-sphere. So this is not quite infinite-dimensional manifold, but still. Uh, and let us take here an action of U1, so of the circle, which rotates uh, this sphere around the z-axis. Right, so what I'm looking for uh, is uh, a subset uh, or a submanifold here in the two-sphere such that each orbit intersects this uh, uh, subset uh, once. Well, uh, this action is, of course, not free. Right here are fixed points, the north and the south pole. So let me uh, delete those. But if I do this, uh, what I can take, I can take uh, one of the great circles, or half of the great circle. So for instance, this uh, guy. And it's easy to see that, so this is now S, that this has the required property, so this is a slice.
Now, <coughs> the proposition is, uh, so assume, uh, so let G act freely on X. So uh, I assumed this sort of from the very beginning, but let me state this again. Uh, and uh, assume there is a slice through each point in X, then the quotient uh, X mod G is again a manifold. And it's easy to understand why, right? So uh, locally near each point you can uh, identify the set of orbits with a slice, uh, but uh, since I have required that S itself is a submanifold, so uh, the quotient is a submanifold. So now let us uh, assume the previous setups. That is what we have is uh, we have a family of maps, Kelly F from X cross W into Y. So uh, let me assume that this is a family of G equivariant. for the whole maps. So uh, this means in particular that I have an action here on X, I have an action on Y, and F respects this action. But I don't need to have an action on W. And uh, whenever we have uh, uh, an equivariant map, or here we have uh, a family, we have the so-called deformation complex. So uh, what we have is uh, first, and Lee, uh, map from the Lie algebra of G into the tangent space to X. So this is our map Rx. Now we can take the differential of Fw and we end in Ty, Y, and then in zero. So this is called the deformation complex. And the name <coughs> complex here is not uh, a random one, so uh, what you can uh, check easily is that if Fw is G equivariant, that actually implies that what we have here, so let be star, star is a complex. Now, why is this uh, really uh, an interesting thing uh, to study? So, let us, uh, let us consider the cohomology groups uh, of this complex. So what we have is H0, H1, and H2. Now since I uh, have assumed that uh, my action is free, so in particular it's locally uh, free, this means that Rx is injective, so in this particular setup, the first cohomology, uh, well, uh, I have to know this as uh, zero cohomology group uh, is trivial, so uh, let me say this is just R, uh, this is zero. Now, if y is a regular value uh, for this map, this means that this map is surjective, and this means that they don't have any cohomology group on this place. Right, so this is, again, trivial, provided y is a regular value. 
Right, and so what is H1? Uh, H1 is uh, the kernel uh, of the differential uh, mod the infinitesimal action, and this is precisely the uh, tangent space, so this is the tangent space to Fw inverse of y mod the g action. Okay, uh, so, so if this uh, deformation complex describes us the uh, tangent bundle to the uh, moduli space, so to this MW. All right, so let me denote here dx to be uh, Rx dual uh, Tx F W, so this is now a map from T X X into the Lie algebra of G uh, plus T Y Y. Right, so what I did is uh, I just uh, took the joint of this map, and this is precisely where I uh, sort of needed that my spaces are Hilbert spaces to have uh, the same uh, origin here. Okay, so uh, let us Yeah, so here is the main theorem. So assume the following holds. So uh, we have G X freely on X. Y is a regular value for FW, set condition is there exists a local slice through each X in X, and the fourth condition is uh, that DX as a linear for the whole map. Say uh, of index D. Then MW uh, is a smooth manifold of dimension D. Again, this is all uh, really very similar to what we had uh, before, so I won't prove the theorem. The only thing what you need to realize here that if you have an action of a Lie group and you have a slice, you can restrict to the slice, and what we have done before goes through uh, essentially unchanged. All right, so, uh, let me skip the proof. Now, uh, a corollary of that is, uh, sure. You, you were saying this is a family of Fred Holm maps to begin with. Is that really what you meant? It was geochromatic Fred Holm? Um, no, uh, I mean, uh, you're right. Uh, uh, let's say uh, only uh, G equivalent maps. And what I meant for the home is that this uh, complex is uh, 
either elliptic or you say that this operator is free home. But uh, sort of literally, that's uh, false. Now, a corollary of that is if in addition to the determinant bundle of dx uh, is trivialized, then uh, Well, and we also need to require that uh, this trivialization is G uh, equivariant, and G invariant, say, then MW is oriented. Uh, moreover, the oriented for this class of M W does not depend on W. Okay, that is uh, more or less the main theorem that I wanted to uh, present today. Um, so uh, the strategy for uh, our particular uh, examples that we will uh, that we have in mind will be. The following, so we will have exactly, uh, you know, we will have one map uh, from X to Y, which will be uh, G equivariant. It will turn out that Y is not necessarily a regular value, so we will be looking for a family so that in family we have a regular value and we can apply in the, uh, the machinery that we have developed today. Okay, that's all I wanted to tell you today. Are there any questions left? Um, what is a local slice in part three of the theorem? Uh, that's the same as slice. So uh, what I meant is, uh, so here, for example, you have a slice which works for any point. So then it's called a global slice. But if you have just slices through each point, which, is, which are not necessarily global, sometimes uh, you would say it's a local slice. So it's just, it just a slice, the same as slice. Okay, then uh, see you in the afternoon.